Uh, Scott Benjamin will be moderating that one. And I think if you go on the Brookfield patch, you'll find all the information you need to get involved with that. The format tonight is that we're going to give each candidate two minutes to introduce themselves and, and so you can get to know them if you don't already know them. And then we're going to ask a series of questions and each uh, candidate again will get two minutes to answer the exact same question. We're going to go down and ask the same question of everybody. Uh, the, again, they've seen the topics, but not the specific questions. And a lot of the questions came from many single one of those questions into the agenda for this evening. We're also going to uh, mix up the order of appearance and this way not uh, any candidate always has to go first or always has to go last so everybody have a chance to be in both uh, positions on that. Uh, my role as moderator is going to be frankly to be as invisible as possible. Uh, you don't want to hear from me. Uh, you will only hear from me when time is up. I will let the uh, candidates know about that and uh, obviously we're uh, you know, going to go with the polite and respectful of each other's time. So if I say time is up, please finish the sentence and not start a new thought. And uh, this way we can get to as many questions uh, as possible. So this, uh, the, the way it's going to go with the, uh, with the order of appearance, we're gonna start off with the state senators going first, candidates there, and then the state representatives. We'll start with the incumbents and go with the challengers. So it'll go this way. Uh, Republican State Senator Craig Miner will go first. Democratic State Senate, uh, Candidate Dave Gronbach will go second. Uh, Republican State Representative Steve Harding will introduce himself third. And Democratic State Representative Candidate uh, Kerry Colombo will go fourth on this first round. So, uh, Mr. Miner, it is to you and uh, your introductory comments, please. First of all, I'd like to thank you for allowing us this opportunity uh, in the land of COVID. Uh, it's been much more difficult to communicate with people, and this has certainly become the new way. Uh, my name is Craig Meyer, and I currently serve as the 30th District Senator here in the Northwest Corner. Prior to this, I was elected five times the Chief Elected Official in Litchfield. Uh, I served in between the Senate and the House uh, for some 12 terms, I think, or 12 years. And um, it's a position uh, in all cases that I've thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I serve currently during this term as the ranking member of the Environment Committee, ranking member of the Labor and Public Employees Committee. I also co-chair the Regulation Review Committee. Most people don't know, but after we pass a law, more often than not, it requires regulation. And so we have the responsibility of passing those regulations. I also serve on the Appropriations Committee and I am the Connecticut Legislative Commissioner to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, which is 13 states on the Eastern Seaboard. And all of those have provided me great opportunity to uh, learn more and more about government. Uh, I operate my own business here in Litchfield. I enjoy outdoor activities like hunting, fishing, canoeing, hiking. Uh, I am a forager for mushrooms. Uh, had an opportunity to pass a bill that would allow uh, for the collecting of mushrooms on state property. Most people didn't know we didn't allow that. Um, and so I live in Litchfield, as I said, uh, with my wife, Margie. Uh, we enjoy beekeeping. Uh, we are avid gardeners. We have a Labrador and a cat and some chickens. I would say that we live a very normal uh, Northwest Connecticut life. Over the last seven months, my aide Daniel Davis and I have uh, been all about trying to provide PPE to the district, uh, nursing homes, rest homes, doctors, uh, EMS personnel, gloves, masks, um, pretty much whatever we could find we would share. Mr. Minor, we're at two minutes. Thank you. Uh, next up would be Democratic State Senate candidate Dave Gronbach. Mr. Gronbach. Thanks so much. So yes, my name is Dave Gronbach and I am running for Connecticut's 30th Senate District. And it runs from Brookfield in the south to Salisbury and North Canaan on the Massachusetts border. It's the largest district in the state and thus its communities are a diverse cross section of Connecticut. It includes cities, suburbs, and rural areas. A lot of people don't actually know how big our district is. I'm an attorney. I own my own law firm with my wife, Vanessa. I'm an administrative judge on special education cases. I'm a father of three children in 10th, 9th, and 8th grade and yes, we're dealing with the distance learning and everything else, just like everybody else. Uh, I was the mayor of New Milford and like our district, it is the largest town in the state. 
it also has a lot of the characteristics that we see in the district. A commercial strip on Route 7, historic downtown, suburban neighborhoods and homes, and rural farms with open spaces. Now, as mayor, I work closely with other first selectmen, like Brookfield's Steve Dunn, on issues that affected our towns and the region. Steve and I addressed sewer system issues, Candlewood Lake, traffic issues, connecting our bike and walking trail to extend all the way to the Massachusetts border, and mutual aid for police, fire departments, and first responders. It's clear that no town is an island. We all interact with our neighbors, and we're part of a larger whole. However, the communities of the 30th District have learned to be independent out of a sense that Hartford ignores our corner of the state. Local leaders have learned that if they need resources for reimagining four corners, sidewalks, or a traffic light at Chick-fil-A, they need to go to Hartford and advocate for themselves. I applaud the efforts to do so, but each town should know right from the start that you can go to your senator and he will advocate for those resources in a united front. Now, when Andrew Rohrbach represented this district, we had that kind of collaboration and advocacy. We don't have it now. I'm asking for Sorry, your vote. Uh, the uh, two minutes is up. Oh, thanks very much. All right, Sorry. thank you very much. Uh, moving to the state representative race, uh, state representative Steve Harding, the Republican. Steve? Yes, uh, good, good evening, Mike. Good evening, everyone watching. Um, I wanna first uh, thank the library uh, for putting this uh, event on this evening. Um, this is really a great opportunity for the voters to hear from the candidates. Uh, to hear from them on their positions on, on really important policies that we're going to be voting on up in Hartford. So I do want to thank Rachel. I know she put a lot of time and effort into making this possible. So thank you to her, Yvonne, with her great work with the library as well. Mike, thank you for, for moderating. It's not an easy job, and we appreciate you doing it. Uh, and of course, the most important part, Dan, the IT specialist, because uh, without his help, we would not be able to, uh, to enjoy this evening tonight. So thank you to everybody involved. I want to thank uh, to Senator Minor, uh, Senator or Mr. Gronbach, uh, Ms. Colombo for, for participating tonight. It's great to have everybody involved. Um, it has been my honor to, to serve the 107th District um, these past uh, five years. I got elected in 2015 at the ripe old age of 27, and uh, my life has changed a lot since then. I've uh, met my beautiful wife, Kelly, and we have a two-year-old son, Carter, together now, and uh, have a, a daughter on the way in December, so our family is growing. And, uh, it, it's provided me a different uh, perspective on, on, on why I do this. Um, I want my son and, and my daughter and uh, my future daughter to, to have the experiences that I had growing up here in the 107th District. Uh, this is a beautiful, amazing community. Uh, Connecticut is an amazing, amazing state. Um, we have so much to offer. Uh, and I want to make sure that, that, that my children uh, have the same future uh, and experience the same uh, childhood uh, that I was able to enjoy here in Connecticut. Um, and uh, it, it has been an honor of my lifetime. Uh, one of the greatest honors of my lifetime uh, to be the uh, representative for this district and be the chief advocate to, to put this community first and always, and I always will. Uh, so I appreciate uh, everyone for joining this evening. I look forward to a great conversation. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Democratic State Representative Candidate Kerry, uh, Kerry Colombo, uh, you get two minutes, please. Hi. So yeah, thank you to everybody for participating in this, um, those who organized it, and particularly for those who are tuning in, because being a part of the legislative process and um, you know, uh, affecting your civic duty is a wonderful part about being a citizen here. So I really appreciate that everybody's taking the time to, uh, to take a listen here and learn about the candidates. Um, my name is Carrie Colombo, and the, uh, I'm the Democratic candidate for the 107th District, which serves all of Brookfield and parts of Bethel and Danbury. I'm the mom of two daughters. I've got a middle schooler and a high schooler, their first years in both of those schools. And so all those wonderful adjustments, as well as distance learning going on here. Um, I have been married for 30 years to my husband, and partner, and I've run a small business for the last 15 years. I do home organizing. So I've had the opportunity to make really close connections with people in um, a very personal way and making really tough decisions in their lives and in their homes over the years. I'm super passionate about the work that I do in the community. And that's one of the things that drove me into throwing my hat in the ring. I've never run for office before, but 
I think it's just so important if you're passionate about something that that you get involved in any way that you see that you can make a change. And, and that's what I'm doing here tonight. And that's why I'm running for office. I've been very involved in addressing food insecurity. I've rescued um, over a million pounds of food um, to um, take that from the shelves of stores that were going to throw it away because you know you get new tomatoes in you have to get rid of the old tomatoes so we rescue all that food and and have distributed that to area food pantries feeding the food insecure i'm super passionate about that and uh, in doing that we also I'm sorry your two minutes is up uh, okay can i finish my sentence <laughs> thanks um just uh that in rescuing the food we in addition to feeding the food insecure saved the environment from all those harmful emissions thank you thank you thank you all for your opening uh statement so we're going to move now into the questions and again the topics were known in advance the the questions themselves were not uh, the first topic, uh, probably of no surprise, is, uh, is about COVID and keeping Connecticut safe uh, from COVID. Uh, the question is this, and it goes first, by the way, to, uh, to Dave Brownberg. Uh, 4,500 persons in Connecticut have died this year from COVID, and we've recorded nearly 58,000 cases. Schools are slowly starting to fully reopen, and as of today, October 8th, restaurants are allowed to have 75% indoor capacity on their seating. What role do you see for the state legislature in helping to find the right balance between keeping all of us healthy and safe and protecting our economy from collapsing? Dave, please. Thanks so much. And I'm going to keep track of my time myself this time so I don't lose it. Yeah, it's, it's a really pertinent and great question. So we've got the legislator really does have an important role in, um, in balancing these two things. So we've got to provide the resources so that we could allow people to operate safely within our state. So there, there's a couple of things that the legislature needs to be able to do. It needs to provide rapid and consistent um, testing and that's freely available for people. Otherwise, you know, the economy and businesses, they're not gonna be able to operate unless people have confidence that they could go out into the world, that could, they patronize these businesses um, safely and without fear that um, they're gonna be exposed to something. So I think testing is really kind of tantamount to, um, to increase, to, to give people confidence. And then in addition to testing, we've gotta make sure that there's contact tracing that's available. So if somebody does have a positive, we need to be able to track down, um, you know, that whole uh, environment of contacts that people have come into contact with. Uh, we need to expand access to healthcare so that if somebody is, you know, is exposed to COVID, they don't go into work. Um, you know, there is, they don't follow this incentive to go to work and put food on the table because if they don't, they're gonna lose their job. Um, and, but at the same time, they would be, risking exposure to a whole bunch of other people. So things like paid family medical leave are tr critically important to people so that if they do get exposed, they do get sick, they could stay home, quarantine and get better as they need to uh, without exposing everybody else. And the balance is really important too. So we need to provide um, support for small businesses so that you know, they could stay open. Uh, if they've got a, you know, we, want, we want them to have the revenue to pay for employees and not lay them off. If somebody does have to go out and pay family medical leave, we want businesses to be able to be, you know, to have support from the state so that they don't bear that financial burden. It's a balance, but we could do it. Thanks so much. And Mike, we have two minutes to answer. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I think I was on mute. Yes, you do. Sorry. So uh, Craig Miner, we'll start uh, the clock now, two minutes. Thank you. So I, I think when you um, kind of opened up this topic, you, po you pointed out what I think is really the problem here. The problem is that COVID is not just a health risk. It's a mental health risk. It's a business risk. Uh, it's a revenue risk. Uh, everything about this illness um, has created, I think, um, a troubling circumstance in the state of Connecticut, where no matter who you are, it's affected you. Uh, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, for the first six months, 
we help people try to get through the financial risk, at least at home, by getting them qualified for unemployment and then getting them qualified for federal unemployment. And that allowed them to stay in a safe place for a period of time when even the healthcare community wasn't really sure how to deal with COVID. Uh, I would say that the state has um, not done a good job uh, in the area around nursing homes. If you look at the number of individuals that have passed uh, having been residents of nursing homes, it's an extraordinary, staggering number uh, of those that have passed here in Connecticut. And I think uh, we're getting a better, better handle on that, uh, but we still got a long way to go. Uh, some facilities like Gear Memorial have done a much better job uh, with that than other facilities. Uh, I supported the governor's approach of creating a COVID positive return facility. Sharon uh, has a unit uh, so that if you came out of the hospital there in, Sh in Sharon and you were still not COVID negative rather than sending you back to a nursing home, it allowed you to convalesce there uh, in the safety and security uh, where people didn't have to worry about whether you were still infectious. Um, we have begun to develop a supply of PPE uh, across the state. Uh, I almost uh, don't run into anybody anymore uh, that says we need this or we need that. Um, the numbers are still low, and I think we're going to, as those numbers start to go up, if they go up, uh, certainly we're going to start to go through that material. Uh, but from a financial perspective, it's just as troubling for COVID That's as two, health. Two minutes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, so, Carrie Colombo, you are next. Uh, COVID. Carrie, you're on mute. I said, could you repeat the question one more time, please? Absolutely. 4,500 persons in Connecticut have died this year from COVID, and we've recorded nearly 58,000 cases. Schools are slowly starting to fully reopen. And as of today, restaurants are allowed to have 75% indoor seating capacity. What role do you see for the state legislature in helping to find the right balance between keeping us healthy and safe and protecting our economy from collapsing? Yeah, I think the number one instrumental piece of this, obviously, is listening to our health experts, listening to our scientists, our epidemiologists, and really, um, understanding and tracking um, where we are seeing spikes in, in COVID cases so that we are very um, sensitive to that in our individual communities so that we can respond appropriately. I think the legislature has done a really nice job and the governor has done a nice job overall with addressing some of the needs of the community. Thankfully, we do have that uh, paid family medical leave that was instituted and that is available for people. The, the increase in unemployment benefits have been just, the, the benefit of that is just um, insurmountable for families to help get them through the bill paying that we've had to endure. The health insurance, um, the legislature passed um, the ability for families to go on the state health insurance. You know, my family, uh, we lost our jobs at the beginning of COVID, my husband and I, and we had to go on unemployment for a while, and we had to go on the state health insurance for a while, and it was such a blessing for us, and I know it's been a blessing for a lot of people in the community, and we need to afford those benefits to people to help them get through this, because this is not going away anytime soon. So we need to make sure that we're continuing to support our families in those ways and also provide some additional support for all the families who are struggling with two working parents and kids in school and juggling all of those responsibilities as well. Thank you, Ms. Colombo. And then Steve Harding, uh, question now to you on COVID. Thank you, Mike, and, and thank you to everyone for, for the very thoughtful response on this, on this, uh, this critical subject. Um, I first want to acknowledge you know, the governor's office uh, working very hard to reopen the state, but I think it's critically important to note that uh, we are reopening the state in a very safe, healthy uh, manner, uh, working with healthcare professionals, uh, ensuring that proper regulations uh, are on the books to ensure uh, that uh, those businesses that are reopening, those individuals that are participating or are, 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 um, 
entering those businesses are doing so in a safe fashion. Um, it's one of the reasons why we have not had uh, an increased spread like other states have had is because of the regulations uh, that we've, we've put in place to begin with. And, and we need to be ever mindful as we continue to reopen our state uh, to, to ensure that those regulations are in place to keep us all safe and to continue to work with the healthcare professionals as we continue to reopen. Um, with, with, with that said, um, I think it's really important right now as legislators to focus on these small businesses, particularly those um, consumer-based um, uh, markets uh, or uh, industries in regards to restaurants, mm -hmm. uh, movie theaters, uh, et cetera, that are, that are struggling right now. Um, those businesses can least afford um, tax increases, fee increases, um, can least afford further non-COVID related regulations. And so as we move in uh, to the next legislative session, we need to keep a keen focus on ensuring uh, that we do not place further non-COVID re related regulations on these businesses and uh, not place further tax and fee increases on these businesses uh, because otherwise we're gonna uh, critically stagger um, their growth from getting on the other side of this pandemic. Um, so I think that that's one of the most critical things as we reopen, we really need, need to be cognizant of as legislators in Hartford. Thank you, Steve. That was two minutes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to switch it around uh, in order of appearance. And Steve, you're actually going to go first now on this next question. And the question is one that's uh, near and dear to everybody's hearts, I'm sure, which is extended power outages from severe weather events. And uh, severe weather and extended power outages have obviously impacted the Brookfield region a couple of times in recent years. And the legislature has just approved a new measure that is designed to address, uh, at least begin addressing these long lasting outages. Uh, included is a $250 food and medicine rebate for those who lose power for more than four, uh, 96 hours, as well as a bigger focus on communication with local officials, training for linemen and additional tree trimming. Now, some have called this bill just a first step with more regulations needed. And the question would be, what else needs to happen from the legislative point of view to help prepare for similar weather events in the future? Steve? Mike, great question and uh, something that uh, we absolutely do need to address going into future legislative sessions. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, in this past special session, uh, I was proud to support and work with my legislative colleagues on uh, both sides of the aisle, uh, particularly Representative Ali Brennan, Representative Arcani, both uh, chair and vice chair on the uh, Energy and Technology Committee uh, in crafting uh, legislation that you just mentioned. Uh, what's critically important in that bill is the timeline um, that these uh, utility providers now need to restore power service back. I think that was the part that was just completely unacceptable, completely negligent on the part of Eversource, is the fact that uh, individuals in Brookfield and the surrounding uh, community had to wait nine, 10, uh, I think even in some circumstances, 11 days before power was restored. Um, and so now there are certain penalties that will be implemented by Pura um, after three days of power not being restored. Um, and, and really what it comes down to with these uh, utility companies, unfortunately, is it's, it's, the, it's the profits. And if you start cutting into their profits, uh, they will start doing the things they need to do to provide quality service to our constituents. Um, and so I think we need to continue to, to implement further regulations to ensure they're providing quality service. We need to, need to uh, enact further regulation and legislation to ensure that the rates they're providing our customers uh, are, are um, affordable rates, because frankly, right now, they're not one of the highest uh, electricity rates in the country. Um, and, and, and further uh, to that, I think we need to look at an, an, an entire system of whether or not we have to overhaul the entire system, because I, I don't think we're done with what we just passed. I think there's more that needs to be done, uh, and the actions or the, the lack thereof by Eversource uh, needs to be held, held even more further, further accountable for. Um, and I look forward to doing that in the future legislative session. Thanks for that answer. Carrie uh, Colombo, you're next. Yeah, so I think this was a good first step that was just passed, but I do think that there's more work to be done. I, I do believe that, um, you know, Eversource started outsourcing their, um, their cleanup crews, if you will, and we didn't even have anybody standing by in state to come and take care of uh, getting the electric up and running after this past storm. It was ridiculous. We're sitting around for days 
people had their medicine that was lost that needed refrigeration. We had people on um, medical equipment that requires electricity that didn't have access to that. We had stockpiles full of refrigerated food and freezer food that people have you know, accumulated for COVID reasons. And that was all lost. And, and that's just a terrible thing. Not to mention all these homes that we all run on well service and require electricity for that. I talked to one mom, they were collecting rainwater so that they could wash their cloth diapers for their five month old baby. This is inexcusable. They were without power just like us for eight days over in Bethel. And that's just not, not something we should tolerate. I, I believe that we should have minimum staff, um, minimum in-state staffing requirements on call, uh, not using the subcontractors. I think we should have free, freezes on the rate hikes. I think that the um, utilities should be required to invest in their own business, not passing those costs on to customers, but they should be burying power lines. And we should really seriously consider decentralizing the grid, giving municipalities more control over their own local community. That's worked in some communities in Connecticut, and that's something we should consider over here as well, as well as investing in renewable energy and looking more into geothermal renewable resources. Barry, thank you very much for that answer. Moving to the State Senate, uh, Craig Miner, I uh, would we'll turn to you now, please, for an answer on that question. Thank you for the question. Um, certainly, I think this was a good first step. The bill that we passed uh, does call on rate making agencies to um, look deeper into the conduct of Eversource and other utilities in the state of Connecticut. Um, I do agree that I think we need to have more staff here in place in Connecticut. Uh, that can be done a number of different ways. Uh, it seems to me that they did not have, at least in this case, enough oversight of the out-of-state uh, people that came here to help. Uh, per personally, I witnessed um, tens of people many, many times, groups of 10 standing because they were waiting for direction. And the concern I had, A, was that people weren't getting their power back, but B, this is all gonna be boiled down to somebody's bill. Uh, in the past, uh, the rate making agencies have allowed them to pass all of these costs on uh, to our constituents, and I think that's wrong. And so uh, one of the good things in the bill was that it requires some benchmarking of results. And so theoretically, they would not be able to get a rate increase if they couldn't show, demonstrate that they were able to provide sustainable power over a period of time and then reconnecting people in a shorter period of time. Uh, so that was one of the issues that I think uh, was important in the bill. I also agree with Representative Harding uh, that we have a long way to go. Um, we can kind of set out the course and we'll see what the uh, rate making agencies do in terms of holding the line on costs. We're probably gonna have to take another swipe at this. I'm not opposed uh, to any number of things and including looking at how large Eversource has grown to be. Uh, it just seems that they're almost immobile uh, it was very hard for chief elected officials to get results. And so I think most of them would tell you we spent the majority of our time on the phone texting, trying to get people in hard hit areas to even get roads opened up, let alone power turned on. Two minutes, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dave Brombach, uh, two minutes, please. Thanks so much. So yeah, first of all, there was a bill back in 2012 that would have been the first step. It would have set the standard at two days without power before rebates kick in, and it would have capped executive pay, which is pretty relevant now considering that Eversource's CEO was paid $20 million last year. If we'd capped the pay back in 2012, if we'd set the standard at two days back then, we wouldn't be in this place. We wouldn't be at a first step. We'd maybe be at a second or a third step. But my opponent voted against that bill then, and we're still kind of dealing with the same Groundhog Day issues every couple of years when we have these storms. Four days is too long. It's too weak. It should be moved up to two days because when you say four days, that's the standard that Eversource is going to work towards. We need to move it up. Number two, minimum staffing. Absolutely, linemen and crews need to be employed. They need to come from Connecticut. Eversource is importing people from Georgia after there's a storm. It's crazy. They hope that big storms miss us, and when they do hit, they hire cheaper crews from other parts of the country. 
if we're paying for the service, the jobs and the crews need to come from Connecticut so that we are the priority. And going forward, power lines can be put underground to avoid damage. Most roads are going to see either maintenance or rehabilitation in the next 10 years. We can require that when, we're, when roads are redone, Eversource has to bury the lines at the same time. And if we'd started this 10 years ago, we'd be halfway done by now. And people are gonna say it's too expensive, but remember that $20 million salary just for the CEO. And finally, the most important thing, legislators need to keep the pressure on Pura and Eversource going forward. You guys are gonna be done, you're gonna be occupied with other things. Now it's fresh in our minds, but in six months, the spotlight will be on something else. That's when Eversource's lobbyists will pressure legislators to weaken oversight. I haven't taken any lobbyist money, my opponent does, and that lobbying is one of the main reasons why we keep going through this every couple of years with these storms and outages. Thank you for that answer. And we now move on to the next question and we're going to go to Carrie Colombo first on this. Carrie, the question is about educational priorities. Education topics, of course, have been uh, largely overshadowed and dominated by COVID uh, and distance learning and full school reopening and whatnot this year. Uh, Brookfield just uh, in the last couple of weeks, in fact, I think it was just last week, got state funding approved uh, for the, uh, the elementary school project uh, from, uh, from Hartford. But some of the other issues that are on voters' minds that uh, submitted questions for this event uh, include such things as regionalization of schools, charter schools, and the overall school funding formula. So the question is, how do you stand on these issues and what are your priorities for education in Connecticut? Two minutes and you are muted. Oh, no, you're not, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think that, you know, we have dollars coming into our district and we need to keep it for our kids here in the district. It needs to go to public school funding. You know, that's what our taxes are paying for. It should go to our public schools. And the only, you know, we're, we're constantly in this battle um, for education budget. And that's another issue here too, is the state is trying to kick education budget responsibilities back to the municip municipalities. And that's a real burden for our constituents. I think that should be more centralized coming from the state. And uh, the reasoning behind that is it's a more equitable distribution. And that also addresses the problem with equity in education throughout our state. And I think that's something that's super important. We need to pay attention, not just to Brookfield, Bethel and Danbury, which obviously I will be fighting for, but we also have to look at the state as a whole. And um, one way that not only we will benefit from uh, moving the um, state education, giving the responsibility back to the state a little bit, you know, we in our, our district will benefit as will the whole entire state because we'll have a more equitable distribution and we don't have to worry about fighting for a school budget every year where it always ends up that um, people are, are voting down our budgets and then our students suffer because of that because we don't have enough funding and then we're cutting programs and year after year after year we're seeing um, we're seeing programs leaving the district and that's just not the way it should be. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, Steve Harding, you are next uh, two minutes on education. Yeah, yes. Uh, thank you, Mike, and th thank you, Ms. Colombo, for her thoughtful response. Um, I, I, I want to say that, you know, this, this really, first off, you know, your, your question regarding regionalization, I'm 100% against regionalization. We, we, uh, we should be, uh, the local um, towns should be deciding how to educate our students. We should not, the state shouldn't be coming in and saying that uh, the school should be segmented uh, per the probate districts, which was one of the, the bills that was proposed. So we should be uh, in our local communities educating our students. That's number one. Number two, um, in regards to ECS funding, uh, you know, Governor Malloy uh, a couple years ago uh, and the majority in the legislature proposed multiple budgets that completely eliminated funding to Brookfield, completely eliminated ECS funding to Brookfield. Uh, and also in, in one of the proposals completely eliminated ECS funding to Bethel who receives about $8 million in ECS funding. Um, that is completely unacceptable and we need an advocate in Hartford uh, that is gonna put our community first, put our children first. And I will always, always do that. I will put our community first and fight for every single ECS dollar for Brookfield, Bethel and Danbury and I will never ever apologize for that. Sorry, I was muted there. I'm moving to the state Senate race now. And Dave, uh, 
You're up first, uh, two minutes on education. Thanks very much. Um, make sure you guys could hear me. So yeah, on regionalization early on, when the governor made that proposal, I wrote a letter to the editor saying that it was improper. It wasn't right for our region. It's, um, and it was, it was just bad policy. It was rightfully shouted down in a bipartisan manner. So uh, we do regionalization in the 30th district already, and we do it well. Uh, we don't need to be dictated by Hartford on how to do it. Um, I do know how important education is for our communities. I've worked on budgets with our BOE, and I have three children in eighth, ninth, and 10th grade. And too often, we see towns having to make a choice between teachers, staff, programs, renovations, because of budget constraints. Now, the state is supposed to have a formula so school districts know how much education funding they are going to get and how much special ed costs will be reimbursed. And in reality, it doesn't work. You, you're, you're, the person who asked this question absolutely gets it. State education funding is a product of politics and our region gets the short end of the stick. So my priority will be to make sure that Brookfield and our other towns get the education funding that they are entitled to. They gotta get the special ed reimbursement that they are entitled to. It's a huge cost for our districts. And because when we don't, those costs get passed on to our taxpayers and en enough is enough. So we need representatives that are going to raise their voices in support of teachers and our schools instead of blaming them for doing the job that we asked them to do. Uh, Brookfield is building an elementary school with state funding, and that's great. But the repairs for the other schools, the roofs, the HVAC, the paint and the floors, they're a constant drain on local bu budgets that I will advocate for more state funding for. And it's important to note that when we were talking about education. It's we've got to expand technical education throughout the district. Uh, I worked with NVCC to get more programs in the high schools. We could have trade and certification classes as well. Other areas are doing it. We've just got to catch up. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dave, for that answer. Uh, Craig Miner, two minutes on education, please. Uh, thank you. So first of all, we should be clear. Um, my opponent's team has been the one that has proposed cuts to educational funding. Uh, Representative Harding is quite right, more often than not, the first cut of a budget involves redlining uh, many of the 30th district municipalities funding for education. Uh, we also fought against Governor uh, Malloy's attempt to cut education funding after the budget had passed and put in place a uh, restriction that no governor can cut education funding after we've passed the budget. So those are two, ele two key elements that I think Republicans uh, have been very responsible for the bipartisan budget that was passed in 2018 represents a true formula. So my opponent is not aware that there is a true formula. It's based strictly on, uh, on the number of students in the classroom. It's based on wealth as it has been in the past. It's very, very easy to understand and it goes out 10 years. And so uh, I would urge him to take a look at that. In addition to that, I do think that education needs more money. Special education has been a perennial problem. I think the state should take more responsibility for that. I certainly think in the upcoming legislative cycle, we need to be uh, very careful not to reduce the amount of support that we give to towns, especially during COVID. We have about 20%, depending on the age group, in larger municipalities that were absolute no-show this spring for education. And so we are gonna take a huge step backwards if we're not careful. I think we need to do all we can at the state level in the upcoming months to try and make sure that whatever resources we can put in place uh, to help children get educated and teachers communicate with them is vitally important. I have been a staunch supporter of regionalization when it comes from the bottom up. Many communities see it as an opportunity for our children to learn uh, better. Uh, you get to a small enough number you can't have the course selection. Two minutes, uh, two, two minutes so, Mr. Thank you. But don't go too far because you're the first person to get the next question. So. Got nowhere to go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's on uh, transportation needs and funding alternatives. Uh, can, Connecticut continuously ranks near the bottom in nationwide surveys on the topic of infrastructure safety. In the Brookfield region, of course, Interstate 84, Exit 7, Super 7 uh, remains heavily congested. Uh, some would say that extending commuter train service uh, from Danbury through Brookfield up to New Milford would help take at least some of the cars off the road. 
Uh, and the question then is, should the state spend money to try to alleviate congestion along I-84 or on extending commuter rail service? And either way, in terms of the repairs that need to be made statewide, how should that money be raised? Traditional borrowing and bonding, tolls, or even privatization? Mr. Meyer. Uh, so thank you for the question. I think it actually could be um, some of all the above. Uh, certainly COVID has not helped our situation with the reduction in driving. We've had a reduction in the amount of uh, fossil fuel taxes that we've collected, gasoline, diesel fuel, and the like. Uh, so um, the STF, Special Transportation Fund, is certainly in the same situation as the rest of the state's budget is. That is, uh, that at its current rate, it may well run out of money before the next two or three years. Uh, I would recommend, first of all, that the federal government uh, recognize the fact that this COVID um, pandemic has caused a significant problem in the state's ability to raise its portion, which is an 80-20 grant. Uh, I would certainly advocate that the federal government not require us to put up the 20. Uh, let, us continuing, let us continue to spend the 80% that we would otherwise get and continue to do highway improvements and that way uh, we can keep people working. Uh, additionally, I think that um, we should look at privatization in terms of improvement to a rail line. I've had numerous discussions with DOT about the possibility of running passenger service uh, up into New Milford. I think there are a couple of hurdles that we'd have to get over, uh, but to pretend that that would actually pay for itself uh, there just isn't that amount of traffic. It doesn't mean we shouldn't look at it, uh, but the people uh, that I think have studied this issue uh, realize that it would be um, a little far-fetched to imagine that it would be self-sustaining. Additionally, I would suggest uh, the fact that uh, because of COVID, many people are working from home, and so some of the traffic that went back and forth into Manhattan probably will never go back and forth into Manhattan. I think. Uh, the mayor of New York City is concerned that uh, they won't have the revenue because people are telecommuting. Two minutes. So, I'm sorry, uh, Mark, did, did you want to finish that last quick sentence? Well, I, I think the issue, uh, part of the issue is that we, are, we should uh, end up with uh, more revenue in terms of income tax as a result of telecommuting into the city. And um, it may help us when it comes to securing dollars for transportation spending. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dave Gronbach, the uh, question to you on, uh, on transportation and funding alternatives. Yeah, thanks so much. You know, when we're talking about 84 or passenger rail, what we're really talking about is commuting. You know, we're not talking about, you know, what it's like on a weekend because it's generally not that bad. So I think like we've seen just in the past couple of months, like uh, Craig had said, the pandemic has flipped that on its head. We need to get people off the roads uh, and expanding 84, it just means you're inviting more cars onto it. And in a couple of years, what happens is the traffic jams up again. If we use this opportunity of the pandemic, get people off the roads and encourage people to work from home. Um, don't spend two hours, you know, driving out to Hartford or trying to get down to Stanford from our district, which is almost impossible to do on a daily basis. Let's get it, let's expand infrastructure so that people could work from home high-speed internet, fiber access, uh, lay that foundation so that we don't uh, invite people to use their cars, or if they're gonna use them, you know, it's not five days a week, maybe it's two days a week that they have to commute into an office. That's what I'd like to see, and that's the opportunity that we have on now. I don't believe in uh, passenger tolls for um, car, you know, tolls for passenger cars at all, but I think the governor ran on truck-only tolls, and that's something that we should look at and revisit. You got these trucks, they're using our highways for commercial purposes, they're causing the most wear and tear, and to pay a small fee for the maintenance and upkeep, especially when most of these trucks are just passing through, it makes sense. Um, but the important thing too is we've got to stop being silent about subsidizing the rest of the country with our federal taxes. The people of Connecticut pay billions of dollars more in taxes than we receive back from, from the federal government. And yeah, there's no tolls in Kentucky or South Carolina because the federal government is maintaining their infrastructure with our tax dollars. We need to join with states like New York and New Jersey, Massachusetts and California in demanding that we receive our fair share of financial support. Thanks. Thank you, Dave, appreciate that. 
Uh, Steve Harding, you're up next. Uh, two minutes on uh, uh, the question of transportation and funding alternatives. Thank you, Mike. And, and I think the, this is obviously a, a very critical issue. Um, and the one thing that uh, I, I'm certainly interested in is, is expanding the Danbury commuter rail. I think that that is important. I think that is uh, possibly a uh, a great resource for our community uh, and, and would allow our community to grow if, if, if that commuter rail had more convenient access, particularly to the city um, and, and other areas of our state as well. Uh, that's number one. Uh, in, in regards to the, the funding structure, um, the first thing we can do to, to better uh, to address our, our absolutely crumbling transportation infrastructure in our state is stop rating the transportation fund. Um, and, and so we implemented what we thought was a constitutional lockbox uh, just last year in the 2018 election, we implemented that. And the majority in the legislature uh, rated that fund for tens of millions of dollars just this past budget year after we implemented a constitutional lockbox. And the reason that the, the supporters of this budget said that it wasn't a violation of the constitutional lockbox was because they diverted the funds. They didn't take the funds after it hit the tra special transportation fund. So we want to talk about funding our infrastructure in our state, which is critically important. The first step is being honest with the residents of the state, being honest with the uh, members of our communities and, and, and utilizing the transportation funds strictly for addressing our transportation infrastructure. That is step number one that we absolutely need to be taking in the legislature to ensure that the projects that we need to address, and many of which are in our area of the state, uh, are properly funded at the state level. Thank you very much for that answer. Carrie Colombo. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I agree with a couple of other folks on a few points here. I think technological infrastructure is really critical. We have so many people working from home. I agree that the lockbox for, um, for our highway infrastructure and such should have been used only for that purpose. That is, that is the reason for the lockbox. We need to address the fact that we have roads and bridges that are structurally unsound. And those, those need to be taken care of. We can't just ignore them. It's like having a house and not maintaining it. You know that after a number of years that the costs increase and that you have um, failing um, structures in your home. And we can't do that with our highways and our roadways and our bridges. We don't wanna have a bridge collapse and have people dying as a result. As for funding, um, you know, <laughs> We are one of the only states that, um, that when we travel elsewhere, we're funding all of their highways. And that's because we are paying to go on the New York Thruway. We're paying to go on the Mass Turnpike. We're get, paying to go on the New Jersey Turnpike because they put gantries into place. Um, you know, not everybody uses the highways, but I-95 is a very uh, typically used corridor. It's a through corridor. And it makes sense that out-of-state drivers should contribute to the upkeep, care, and maintenance of our roads. And one way to do that is by putting up gantries along I-95. And again, the reason for that is either Connecticut can pay 100% of our road infrastructure or out-of-state drivers who utilize our roads can help us by paying 40% of that. And then we only are left holding the bill for 60%. It makes good fiscal sense. And uh, you know that's one of the, one of the um, areas that I think we should explore. We should allow other states to contribute to our infrastructure just like we do for theirs. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, we have time, unfortunately, only for one more question. It'll probably push us a little bit over 7.30, but uh, uh, we're going to put this last one in, and it's about affordable housing in the region. Uh, and Dave, this is going to go to you first. The question is, Section 8 housing has been a topic of discussion in Brookfield in, uh, in the recent years. And some have suggested that it may be time to revise the 1990 state law that granted additional weight to developers and disputes over local zoning in order to add affordable housing to the state's housing stock. Where do you stand on this issue, both in terms of Brookfield specifically and in terms of the need for affordable housing throughout Connecticut? Thanks. Yeah, that's a really, it's a controversial issue. Let me first, by, by addressing the language being used, 
affordable housing is not Section 8 housing. They're completely, they're two different things. And so I think part of the anger and the frustration and some of the negativity about these developments is the confusion between Section 8 and affordable. Affordable housing has income limits. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, people that apply for or need affordable housing, there are teachers, there are nurses, there, there are single parents, there are senior citizens that are looking to age in place. Um, this is not a Section 8 type of situation. So you need to be very clear about the, the clarification between those two things. Uh, affordable housing, we opened multiple affordable housing um, projects in New Milford with great success. They're not Section 8, um, but they work great when the developments are consistent with the character of the community. They could become controversial because communities feel like it is forced down their throat. So I do believe that there is an opportunity in Hartford to look at this law. It needs to be changed to encourage cooperation rather than opposition. Uh, I'll work with municipal leaders and developers and housing advocates to achieve more affordable housing, which is what, it's a really good goal for the community in general. We wanna see police officers and nurses and uh, all these people that form the backbone of our community actually live in our community. But the, when you have a community of single family homes, a lot of times they get priced out and that's a problem. So affordable housing helps us address that issue and, um, but it does have to be balanced with the needs of the community, the character of the community. I know in Brookfield, they had, um, you know, the original proposal was for a six story apartment building. That's too much. They got it down to three stories and it's more consistent with Brookfield's character. I'd like to see more of that collaboration in instead of opposition and conflict. Thank you, Dave. Craig Miner, uh, it is to you the uh, same question about uh, Section 8 housing. So I, I think the fact of the matter is that many communities across the state, large and small, have done quite well in the development of affordable housing. Uh, back when I was first selectman, we entered into a number of different projects, both for senior housing and non-senior housing to provide, uh, as David said, um, more cost affordable, more affordable housing uh, for people in the community. We ended up in Litchfield with teachers, firefighters, policemen from adjoining communities, uh, it, they came from every walk of life and it gave them a start. Uh, we have scattered site housing in Litchfield. Uh, we have larger uh, complexes, uh, especially among seniors that provides congregate meals and that sort of thing, at least the possibility uh, for that. So uh, the real problem in small communities is the infrastructure cost. Um, we have poor soils here. Many communities do not have sewer plants. The DEP and the Department of Public Health have been opposed to looking at technology that works in other states across the country uh, that might make affordable housing options more viable in these small communities, but they've been very re resistant uh, to actually uh, move down that path. Uh, communities that have been successful in completing projects have been rewarded by the state of Connecticut through bond dollars and other appropriations expertise uh, to try and keep moving the next project along. And so I don't think it has to be something uh, in the six story fashion, I would agree with David. Uh, if we're gonna head down the road of separating the character conversation uh, from affordable housing, we're gonna have a battle in every community in the 30th district. Um, the Democrats have proposed withholding state funding for education in the past. Uh, thankfully this past year, that was not a part of their proposal. Uh, and so I think it's that hammer approach that does not work well. And I think if we just provide the tools, many communities will continue to pursue uh, what I would call workforce housing on into the future. Thank you, Mr. Miner. Uh, Carrie Colombo, uh, the question is to you now on housing. Yeah, so it's no secret that housing is too expensive in Connecticut and it is unaffordable for a lot of people and that's why we need the affordable housing. We need the housing for our seniors, we need the housing for our nursing assistants, we need housing for teachers and firefighters and police. We need housing for our adult children when they grow up to be able to come back to our communities and live here. Uh, we need housing for disabled people and for single parents and for young families that are just starting out. And you know it's it's critical to our communities to have um, to have that afforded to people. 
Um, the fact is that Connecticut has implemented the affordable housing rules on a state level because they've recognized the history of our government-sponsored redlining and racism and the per pervasive wealth gap that we see throughout Connecticut. Affordable housing helps to level that playing field. It um, is a requirement in the state and for every town. So we can either participate willingly and within our zoning rules, or it's gonna happen without our consent. Now, our, our first selectman, Steve Dunn, has done a fantastic job of, of managing that in Brookfield. And he successfully um, attained a moratorium three years ago because he has planned and thought ahead of how to introduce the affordable housing into our community in such a way that it is in keeping with our landscape. Um, as uh, Mr. Gronbeck mentioned, um, they, a few years back, I was very actively involved in the meetings about the Renaissance Project, which was a six-story apartment building that a builder had um, proposed for the town, and it was completely not in keeping with our community. And um, our first selectman was able to negotiate that down to three stories successfully and get that moratorium because we were introducing the affordable housing that is required for our community. And next year, as a result, he'll be able to renew that moratorium because we're on the right path going forward. Thank you for those that response. And Steve Harding, you get the, the last word of the evening. Thank you. Um, so it, the, the law that um, we're referring to is 8-30G, um, which was implemented in, in 1990. And um, the reason that I'm opposed to the law uh, is because it has little to do with affordable housing and has everything to do with allowing greedy developers to completely usurp our zoning laws. Uh, when you have a developer that comes into our community and says that they want to put, put a six-story building at 777 Federal Road, um, when we don't even have a ladder that reaches the sixth floor uh, and a law that's on the books that allows for something like that should not be on the books. And, and, and the reason why our community and first selectman Dunn and other town officials are forced to apply for, a, and, and, and I work with them to do this, and, and are forced to apply for a moratorium uh, is because they, they're trying to avoid a law that allows a developer to come in and put a six story building when we don't even have a ladder that reaches the sixth floor in our fire department. And, and, and what was uh, obscene about that process was that our, our, our assistant fire chief at the time, uh, Andy Ellis uh, addressed that with the developer and the response was, well, I guess you can call Danbury if something like that happens. And, and so really what it comes down to is any law that comes on the books uh, that allows for such a process should, should, not, should not be on the books. Um, affordable housing should be developed uh, with the community uh, and, and within our, our, our zoning laws here, here in our community. Um, it, it, should, it should not allow developers to completely usurp our zoning process. Our zoning boards, our wetland boards, um, our planning boards in our town should have the ability to determine uh, how our community is developed. Um, this, this, the state bureaucrats in Hartford shouldn't be telling uh, us what we, what we can and cannot develop. Um, and, and, and should not be putting our first responders in a place where um, volunteers are, are forced to climb a ladder uh, to six stories uh, high um, because of an 8-30G law. Thank you, Steve. I want to say thank you quickly to all four candidates for participating this evening. It really was uh, gracious of them to come here tonight and share their, their views. So Craig Miner, Dave Gronbach, uh, Steve Harding, and Kerry Colombo, thank you all very much for what you've done this evening. And thanks again to everybody for, for uh, dialing in. Uh, Rachel, I'm going to turn it back over to you and uh, say thank you. Great. Uh, I also would like to thank our candidates, uh, Steve, Carrie, Craig, and Dave. Um, and thank you to our moderator, Mike Allen. Um, thank you to everyone who sent in a question tonight. I'm sorry we didn't get to use all of them, but we tried to use as many as we could. And thank you to everyone who uh, joined us to listen in. Um, assuming our recording turned out okay, um, we will make the recording of this program available on the library's Facebook and YouTube pages. Um, please also check out the library's um, website for more voting related uh, programs and information. Uh, we have a conversation with our town clerk and our registrars on voting safety and election integrity um, that's posted now. And we will be posting a video tomorrow about how to fill in and fill out and mail in um, an absentee ballot. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great job. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.